everybody, welcome back to my channel. How are you doing? Happy December. I have my snowflake earrings on right now and my red lipstick. I'm feeling very festive, so I hope you guys are doing well. Today, I'm doing a little bit of a different video. I took inspiration from Sam Johnson's video on how he became a voice teacher. By the way, you guys should check him out. I think he's incredible. And today, I wanted to tell you about how I became a voice teacher, my journey, and how I ended up doing what I do now. Before we dive in, I wanna give a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Singing Straw. I recently made a video all about straw phonation. You can check it out here. I go into exercises and everything you need to know about how the straw works and why it's so great for our voice. Briefly, it opens our throat, it lowers our larynx, it helps us mix better, and it's my new favorite obsession. So now until the end of the year, my code Hannah Bales not only gets you 10% off, but gets you 15% off. So if you've been wanting to try Singing Straw, now is the time. So as I go through this video, I'm going to answer some questions that you guys asked me on Instagram. And the biggest question was, how did I get started? Did I go to college? Did I do something else? Where did I get my education? Let me tell you my voice teacher origin story. So I have always been a singer since as long as I can remember. When I was a kid, I was very loud and very musical. I played piano and I just couldn't get enough of singing. And I got into voice lessons as soon as I possibly could. The first time I got into voice lessons, I was 12. And where I grew up, we didn't have a lot of voice teachers around. My voice teacher was my choir teacher at the time, Rachel Cavanda, and she was incredible. She helped me come into my voice. She helped me drop some of this shouty quality I had in my voice, but I was really looking for like a musical theater like belt. And so I started teaching myself incorrectly. I'll just throw that out there. I started teaching myself cause I didn't have the resources and wow. <laughs> I'll try to find some videos for you guys. We should do a live stream where we react to my past performances because uh, that's a doozy. But when I got into high school, I worked with a couple other teachers. I worked on opera music and I did the all state soprano competition when I was a senior and I got second place and that was so exciting. I still felt at this time that my identity was wrapped up in my voice. That if I wasn't the singer, I was nothing. Like that was all that I was. It's not a great place to be, by the way. So the next step was I'm gonna go to college. I'm gonna get a musical theater degree and I'm gonna go to Broadway and I'm gonna make it big. And I went to my school and I was kind of halfway in the musical theater program. I had been told by one of the professors that I was definitely gonna get in that year if I auditioned again. And so I felt this intense pressure that I had to be as good as all these other people around me because they were very talented. And also that she was telling me like, this expectation that I would audition again and get in. And it was just not a great time for me. I think the my mental health wasn't so great and I just started having thoughts like, why am I doing this? I'm not having fun. And I say this to my students all the time, if you're not having fun, what's the point? I just wasn't having a good time. I felt like my voice wasn't good enough. I started to get really, really self-conscious about my voice. You could say that's from being a big fish in a little pond in high school, and then I came to college and I came to the real world and met some really talented people. But I really do think that it came down to my identity being fully my voice. I didn't have any other part of me that I really knew and that I liked. So I did something really scary and I stopped singing. I stopped singing for like a year. I didn't sing at all. I didn't sing when I went to church. I didn't sing for myself. I just never sang. And although that's not something I totally recommend, it was good for me at the time because I was able to go to therapy, figure out who am I? What, what do I like about myself underneath my voice? I was able to come back and realize I don't want to major in musical theater and I don't really want to be a performer or a singer as my main job. I've always loved teaching. When I was in high school, I taught piano lessons. So I like teaching. I considered elementary education for a little bit and then realized I definitely couldn't hack that. And then I met my wonderful first IVA teacher, Megan Yates. And in just a matter of a couple lessons, I felt incredible. I felt confidence coming back in my voice. I felt consistency and control and all of these amazing things. Above all, I felt heard. Like her story was similar to mine. She gave me the confidence that I really needed at that time. And then she made a post on Facebook about IVA, Institute for Vocal Advancement. And I felt like I got hit by a train. Like the universe was telling me, of course you should be doing this. Why aren't you doing this? And so that's how I stumbled upon voice teaching. 
I never thought that it was a career path. I guess in my head, all my teachers had been moms or had had other jobs and so it was kind of like a side job. And I never realized that you could do this full time and make a living off of it. And I was all in from the minute I saw that Facebook post, I was in. There's my origin story. But why I love IVA, Institute for Vocal Advancement, is it really worked with my learning style. I recently was diagnosed with ADHD at 28. I had no idea. Now looking back, makes a lot of sense for me. I always said that I didn't do well in a school setting. But I just couldn't focus. And with IVA and the way that it's set up, it's an online program and the classes and lessons and everything that you need to do to get certified is online and it is self-paced. And that was so great for me because not only focus-wise could I kind of go at my own pace, but financially too. So it wasn't something where I had to put thousands of dollars up front, like at a semester at college, I could kind of pay as I go and as I complete these things. And that was important to me when I was a nanny and making very little money. Now, of course, there are other ways that you can become a voice teacher. You can go to college, you can get a degree in vocal pedagogy. There are many teachers that are singers themselves who have become teachers. There's a lot of ways that you can become a voice teacher. This is the way that really worked for me. I love IVA because they also test every year. So every single year, I teach in front of a master teacher, someone with lots of experience, and they grade me on my teaching skills. And it's terrifying, but I do it every year and I get better every year. And I just love that environment. It holds everybody to a high standard. And I think that's pretty cool. Your friend Lauren asked, how do you start up? I wanna teach voice lessons and I don't know how I would start that. Start by picking a form of education that works for you. IVA is not the only online vocal certification program, although I love it, so I'm gonna <laughs> name it as the number one. You can also go to college and get your degree. You can also find a teacher that can mentor you. Some teachers do that. I would say if you have the education and you're thinking about starting up, first thing I would say is start teaching as many lessons as you can, even if they're free and you're just teaching them to your friends. Every time you teach a lesson, your ears get better and your ears are your money maker. Being able to hear the nuances in a student's voice and correct them, that is the most important thing. So every voice you work with, your ears get trained a little bit more. Every year that you teach, you're gonna get better and better and better. You're at the beginning and it feels kind of intimidating, like you haven't taught very many lessons and you're feeling kind of that imposter syndrome, like maybe you're in the wrong career path. Just keep teaching. Teach as many lessons as you can, as many different types of voices as you can. Shane DeCamp says, did you have to be able to play an instrument before you became a voice teacher? You have to be able to play the basic scales in IVA. I play piano to a level where I can accompany my students and I have just really felt lucky that I can do it, but it's totally not necessary. You need to be able to read music so you can pick out notes for your students. You have to be able to know where on the staff in relation to the piano and in relation to the voice, where that all fits in passages and ranges and starting pitches is really important depending on what type of voice you're working with. So you do need to have some basic music theory education, but nothing that you can't learn right now. Even if you are a singer, but you've never touched the piano, you can learn everything you need to know to be a voice teacher, just those basic scales that we do in IVA is what we had to learn. Jenny McCallman said, how do you manage working from home whilst having an attention span of a human? <laughs> While having the attention span of someone with ADHD? I am really lucky because I have a separate workspace. So right now I'm in my studio and it's actually in my backyard. It's my garage that we renovated into a studio. So I get to leave my house and walk across the yard to the studio and this is my workspace. And something about that separation means a lot to me. And we all don't have that ability, right? But I think at home, if you can make your workspace special and just for work, that makes a big difference, just having that separation. Also, uh, medication. <laughs> Did you start out working on your own or did you work for someone else? This is a really great question. So when I started, I did a little bit of everything. The best thing that I did, I'm so happy I did this, was I realized that the only way I was gonna get better as a teacher was to teach as much as possible. So I started teaching musical theater classes at a conservatory. So I would have about 
10 kids in a class and they were they ranged in ages from about 6 to 15 and I would teach them musical theater and that was really cool and then I taught at a studio where I didn't have to get my own students but the owner of this vocal academy got them for me and that was great and then I also taught a little bit on my own and then I built up my own private studio so then I was able to just work for myself I didn't have to work for these other places although I did work at the conservatory for quite a while just because it was a really fun environment. How long did it take you to build your business? I mean, it's still happening, but it, I mean, it was hard. That's the hardest part about being a voice teacher, for sure. I remember times where I didn't have very many students and financially that was really difficult. Just by nature of being a voice teacher, students come and go, which is actually kind of cool because over my career of teaching I've taught hundreds and hundreds of students so I've got to learn a lot of different voices but students might come for a couple months they might come for one lesson and they might stay for years but everyone kind of cycles out and so sometimes there's the perfect storm where you lose like six students <laughs> in a week and that's really hard I've had that happened to me a couple times it's really really hard when I got started I used like local listings to put my business out there and I also taught piano lessons in combination with voice too I also utilized Google so I would have like Google reviews on there and that helped a lot because if anybody searched for voice lessons in my area I was usually the first person to come up so that really helped and that's something I wish I would have done at the beginning was get some sort of online presence a little bit earlier. I would say if you're just barely starting out, get that social media presence going. So get an Instagram, get a Facebook page, maybe even get a TikTok and just start building. And it's gonna feel really weird at first and you might post a video and two people see it, but keep going. That's, that's the best way to get students is that social proof that they can see how you talk and how you teach and they say, oh, I like her, I wanna work with her. Is it necessary to become certified with a particular provider, for example, IBA? I would say, no, it's not necessary, but I do think you're gonna find that you are a better teacher and a more confident teacher if you go that route. Teach, teach as much as you can. I already said this earlier. And be brave, it's scary. It is scary to sit in front of the piano, a singer you've never met, and tell them that you're gonna change their voice. That's scary. But the more that you do it, the more confident you're gonna get. So keep trying. Do you think you can become one even if you didn't start singing at a low age? Absolutely, yes, absolutely you can become one. I think that that is something that if you're passionate about it, you can absolutely become a voice teacher. Brittany said, how do you gain confidence in teaching and explaining what you know about the voice? Time and research and education. I still don't know everything and I'll be the first to admit it. I never ever wanna be that kind of teacher that pretends that she knows everything because that's just impossible. Vocal science is constantly evolving and changing. So I just think being able to find the way that you teach and the words that you like to use when talking about certain subjects. And it's again, just about repetition. So the more that you talk about it, the more you will feel confident in what you're saying. Someone asked, what job opportunities do voice teachers have? Do they make a lot of money? I think that depends. I would say that voice teachers, based on just the pricing and how the market is, do make more money per hour, but it is harder to get like a full 40 hour a week schedule if that's what you're looking for, which is why you have to really build your business to try and get as many students as you can if that's really what you're looking for. But what is nice about that is that you can work less for like a full wage. And as a mom, that means a lot to me. And as for what job opportunities, you can run your private studio business. You can also teach at a music conservatory or group classes or things like that. Or you can work at a studio with multiple other teachers. There's benefits to everything. And at the beginning when I was teaching, I did all three. And the biggest benefit of doing it yourself is that you make the most money. You don't have to pay anybody a cut of that, but you have to find all your own students. So you really are a business owner. I'm getting a lot of questions 
asking how long did it take to be a voice teacher? Well, when I got into the program, I was considered a student teacher. I was just brand spanking new. I didn't really know anything. But that's when I started teaching a lot of free lessons. The more you teach, the better you get. So I would teach as much as I could, got my friends, anybody that I knew, my neighbors, just to let me give them a lesson. And I also worked with a lot of kids and kids are great guinea pigs because they're there, they wanna learn, they're excited to sing. And so you can try some different exercises out on them. But going from a student teacher to a level one that took me a year. Do you pick songs for your students or mostly let them bring in whatever they want? I pretty much let my students bring in whatever they want. I think that's really important. If you have a song that you want to sing and is going to keep you passionate about what we're doing, then absolutely we're going to sing that song. Now it's possible if we bring in a song that is not aligning with our goals at that moment. So we want to learn how to have a really strong mix, but right now we really need to work on our chest voice. Defying Gravity might not be the best place for us to start right now, but we can talk about another song or we could make Defying Gravity, the first half of it, our fun song. If we're not having fun, we might as well quit, right? So if my student comes in and is dying to sing Defying Gravity, we might as well sing Defying Gravity, even if it's just one time at the end of the lesson. And for the rest of the lesson, we work on that chest voice. Gion, hi Gion. What was the most challenging obstacle you faced with students? You know, there's always times when a student comes in and I am struggling to help them. Maybe their voice is not responding to the tools that I have, or maybe it's a voice type I've never heard before. That is really difficult. I would also say that when I was starting out, a big challenge was figuring out how to set boundaries for myself, policies, stuff like that. When you don't have policies, people will walk right over you. So you have to set your cancellation policy, your tuition policy, all of that stuff, and you gotta stick with it and know that you're worth it. So you make those policies and then if someone has a problem with them, they can leave. They probably won't though. So that was a big challenge for me. I didn't want to offend anyone. I was always trying to be so accommodating instead of really just respecting myself and making sure that those policies were really strong. Did you have the exact moment when you realized teaching is for you more than other things? That's a great question. I don't think I had an exact moment, but I have moments like this all the time where my student is successful and you can see how proud they are of themselves on their face and I'm so proud of them and we're just vibing <laughs> together. I'm so excited for them. That success on their face just, it just sustains me. It is incredible. It's an incredible feeling. How do you determine whether or not someone could make it professionally like Broadway? Their work ethic is number one. If I have a student that is doing everything they can to have their weekly voice lesson and they're practicing every day, they're steaming, they're using the straw, they're doing everything they can because they know that this takes work. And I have some students like this right now. That's how I know. Because I I'm not gonna have a student who shows up in my studio who is tone deaf, which is very unlikely by the way. Tone deaf and says, I'm gonna go to Broadway. That's very unlikely. The people I get, I have pretty good voices. So for me, what determines their success is how hard are they willing to work? Do you work with people of all ages and all voice types for people transitioning? I don't work with children anymore. So I mostly work with adults. I don't even really work with teenagers unless I do have a couple really talented teenagers, like 15 to 18, but I mostly work with adults, professionals, but I have worked with all different ages, all different voice types. I think I've just found myself in this a little bit more of a niche through my online presence and everything is who I'm working with are professionals. I haven't worked with as many people who have their voice transitioning, just a couple people. And so I don't have like a lot of experience. I'm definitely not an expert, but for anyone who feels like they could trust me and wants me to help them through that transition in a healthy way, I am more than happy to do that. What are the main things that every voice teacher should know or have in their toolkit? You should know basic piano skills and how to read music you should know where to start a student on the piano because that starting pitch is just as important as the exercise that you've chosen. And you should know basic vocal anatomy. This is a funny question. Do you ever wish you hadn't become so popular and you would have a bunch of people waiting? <laughs> Yeah, I do. This has never happened to me before. I have been really lucky. I've been pretty successful here in my community. So I've 
pretty much always had like a full studio. And I got to a point where I had like a couple people on my waiting list, but that was pretty much it. I would, I would pretty much take everybody because I have a hard time saying no to students because I love what I do. But now I have a waiting list that is very large and it's hard because I just can't bring myself to just say, well, I won't have a spot for at least a year. I can't do that because I know that part of my brand and what I do online is about self-love and singing after, you know, vocal baggage or vocal trauma, anything. I have so many students who come to me and say that they haven't sung in years, but they saw my video and wanted to sing with me. So because I know that those are the students that are on my waiting list, they're there, they're waiting for me because they trust me. That's why I open up every month spots for my waiting list because I see you guys <laughs> and I wanna work with you. Oh, this is a great one. How did you develop your philosophy of education? This is really fun. So I think if I was going to say, you know, I think the other answer is like, how did you develop your brand, right? Cause I'm a teacher and I'm also online. And it comes down to my core values and the students that I love to work with. For years I've developed my teaching philosophy without even really being aware of it. And so my personal style of teaching involves some kind of analyzing. So we ask a lot of questions like, how did that feel? Did it feel different than the last time we did it? Can we put our finger on how that felt different? Let's memorize it. Or something changed. What changed? Let's figure it out and fix it. Asking a lot of questions like that and also explaining the feelings to my students. So you're feeling that way, that is exactly right because here's what's going on in your voice. Here's what I'm hearing. So it's a little bit more talking in that way and very encouraging. So I've said it a million times and I'll say it again. If you're not having fun, what's the point? Even if you're in my studio because you wanna make it to Broadway, I'm not here to berate you. We can make it far and have a really good time as we do it. We can progress and still have a lot of fun. So that's kind of my teaching philosophy and I think I really nailed that down earlier this year when I tried to figure out my brand and how I wanted to present myself online, everything. And it was pretty easy because it's just who I am. I'm not trying to be anybody else, but I realized that bravery was something that mattered a lot to me. So that became one of my brand values was bravery. It's scary to sing in front of a teacher. It's scary to sing in front of anybody. It's very vulnerable. And I just find myself so impressed with my students that come to me and haven't sung for years and they're here and they're doing it and they're being brave. That is so important to me. How do you make sure the student doesn't feel like it's their fault if they don't get it? This is a really good question, Lily, thank you so much. So I always say to my students, everything going on in your voice happens for a reason, okay? So it is never your fault. If we're cracking, if we're tense, if we're squeezing, if we're breathy, all of these things happen for a reason. So then we get to ask ourselves why. Let's be curious, not furious. That's my new favorite phrase. We are going to ask a lot of questions and, and figure it out, but it's never your fault. Also, I'll add, if there's an exercise that isn't working, that's my fault. That is my fault for giving you the wrong tool. So we're not gonna focus on that exercise that didn't work. We're gonna throw it away and we're gonna find an exercise that does work. What part of your work brings you the most joy? You guys know, it's when I see that success on my student's face. And I would also add as more of these types of students come to my studio, students that felt berated or belittled by their last teacher or had some sort of vocal trauma. When they come to me and they say that they felt they could trust me and they feel like I'm so nice, which by the way, shouldn't be so revolutionary, but <laughs> there's some bad teachers out there. That warms my heart. It honestly makes me want to cry. I feel truly honored, honored that they are here and they trust me. That is a great feeling. And my last question is how do you pick a student up when you can tell they're becoming discouraged? I'm really good at telling this now. I think when I was starting out, I would push my students a little bit too far sometimes and we would not feel very good. And I'm really good at reading this now. Sometimes I'll ask them questions or if I feel like I can tell that they're getting discouraged and they are in their head and maybe even we could have some tears here in a second, I start talking as much as possible because if I give them some silence, they're gonna start crying. So I might spend a minute to say, you know what? 
that tool is not working for us. Do you hear how this is happening versus the other exercise we were doing? That means this, and I start explaining to them, this exercise isn't working for you because of this, this, and this. So now let's go back to that exercise that was working for you. That felt a lot better, didn't it? Let's talk about that. Or if we're in a song, we're going to connect back to a moment when we had success. So we're singing a song, we're struggling, I'll come back to the moment that we had success on a different exercise. Maybe we'll bring that exercise into the song and sing all of the words on that exercise. I want to explain to them that there's a reason for everything when you're singing and it's okay. Ugh, I know this is so frustrating. We have to think about seven things at the same time when we're singing. You're doing great. It's all a process. And I also like to warn students like, I'll say, okay, now you're doing so well, I'm gonna push you even further. So they know that I'm going above and beyond so that hopefully they don't feel as discouraged, but it depends on the student for sure. But I would have to say to my teachers out there, really, really learn how to read your students' cues. Because singing is so vulnerable, students hold on to things that you say even if you don't think about what you said. You didn't think that it was mean or belittling or anything, but they hold on to that. So really ask questions, be honest, and really get to know them. I think that it is always better for a student to leave feeling successful and feeling comfortable than anything else. Now in our lessons, we're gonna find progress. We're going to improve our voice in one lesson, I guarantee it, but the number one priority is that my student feels successful. What does that mean? That they truly feel heard and that they did the damn thing. They did the scary thing. That's the most important thing. Okay, this was the longest video ever. If you stay to the end, thank you. Hi. <laughs> You're a true supporter, thank you so much. I'm going to link the Institute for Vocal Advancement down below if you guys wanna check them out. That's how I got my education, I highly recommend them. And now until the end of the year, my code, Hannah Bales, gets 15% off of a singing straw. And until next time, I'm Hannah, I'm your voice teacher, and now you're all my students. Please like and subscribe, ring the bell for notifications, follow me on TikTok and Instagram, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.